الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المرسلين ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تكفر لنا وترحمنا لنكون من الخاسرين ربنا عقنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار يا الله أكرم أنت تحدثنا بنا أبنا ودر في بطاقة الرحمة كلون يا الله أسكت جنوتون سوسايتي كوميتي كم دايت برون بورتي سيا أبنا كوميتي كشارجة كلون आरामदरी हमारे लोगों से था कि अनेक शोधशो बुल्तु पुनो सीनियर शोधशो दारा इतने अच्छे जो लोग ऐसे बहुत और किसी दिन ऐसे बिठा रहे आपने दारे शोपार बोल मार कर ऐसे बोलना हमारे अनेक शोधशो ज़्यादे आती है उसको लाई लवा मार दुनिया अच्छी तो लोग ऐसे दारे अपने को बोल जाते हैं मार क بحنا ربي كربي نسدي عما يصفون وسلام على المسلمين والحمد لله ربي العالمين. Permission from our chairperson, Professor Dr. Muhammad Jalibur Rahman sir, I will start our first topic presentation, that is, risk stratification and measurable respiratory disease of acute lymphoblastic leukemia patient. The speaker is a graduate from Sherry Bahama Medical College Hospital and completed her MD hematology under Bangladesh Sheikh Mujib Medical University. Today, she is also going to share her practical findings on cytogenetics in ALM patients of VSMN. With that, I humbly ask you to give your full attention to Dr. Minati Pao Mukti and help me to welcome her in the stage. Please, Dr. Minati. A very good morning to all. This is Dr. Miruti Mukti. I just completed my post graduation on MD hematology, and it is a great honor to be here to present my topic. This is the risk stratification and MRD of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Here is some basic information that is, it has bimodal distribution. It comprises about 30% of all childhood malignancy. It is five times more common than AML. And regarding incidence in adults, it is about 1.34, whereas in children, it is around 32 per 100,000 in case. And there is huge difference in the survival rate between these two groups of population. In children, the five-year survival rate about 85 to 90%. But in case of adult, it is only 30 to 40 percent. Why risk stratification should be done? It should be done as a part of complete evaluation of ALN and before initiation of management, as well as for targeted therapy. And the importance can be explained in two ways. The first, risk adaptive therapy. What is this? In case of low risk group, we should implied low intensity therapy to reduce the chance of toxicity. But in case of high risk group, aggressive therapy should be considered to reduce the chance of relapse. And by this risk based therapy and some preventive measure in high risk population, survival rate can be improved. Here are some risk factors or prognostic factor that is used in risk stratification that are is initial WBC count, cytogenetics, immunologic subtypes, rapidity and degree of cytoreduction, that is the response of treatment. There are some other less important factors as the modern treatment is so strong and the outcome is more powerful before that. So these factors become based on no 
longer significant at all. That includes six, five subtypes, presence of mediastinal mass, organomegaly, lymphadenopathy, hemoglobin level, race, platelet count, and serum immunoglobulin. There are four risk categories based on these factors. The favorable is that is less than 10 years, low WC count, less than 50,000, presence of favorable cytogenetics and rapid response to treatment are in low risk group. Favorable is low WBC count, favorable response to treatment, but without favorable cytogenetics are considered to have standard risk. And in high risk group is more than 10 years, WBC count more than 50,000, unfavorable cytogenetics and emerging more than 0.01% at day 28 to 36 of induction therapy. And in very high risk group, is more than 13 and less than 1, presence of some unfavorable cytogenetics and failure to achieve CR at the end of induction. This figure showing the age distribution in childhood and adults ALN, as I previously mentioned, it is a disease of the children. So about 60% cases contributes to less than 20 years of age group. This figure showing the age-based risk distribution in childhood and adult ALN, and it explains why the survival rate is better in children and poor in adults. In children, the maximum portion have good risk cytogenetics, so they fall in low risk category. In contrast, in adults, they have the bad risk cytogenetics prominent, so the survival rate is lower than children. What is the importance of cytogenetics? It plays an important role in risk stratification and it has a great impact on prognosis. And presence of different cytogenetics abnormalities, we can divide in three groups. EGP6 run X1 and presence of high hypertrophy that is chromosome number more than 50 includes in favorable group. Normal karyotype and hyperdiploidy in intermediate group and unfavorable risk groups are presence of translocation 932, BCR ABL1 signature, KMG 12 arrangement, intrachromosomal amplification of 21, abnormal 17P and loss of 13Q, and hypodiploidy. And usually this cytogenetic abnormality is associated with increased risk of relapse. Immunophenotype, the another prognostic factor. Uh, it is not clear whether the outcome of T-cell ALN is directly related to its phenotype itself or the presence of initial WBC count, presence of mediastinal mass, and CNS involvement. But it is generally accepted that the T-cell ALN should be regarded as a high-risk ALN and treated accordingly. And among the subtype, the early thymocyte precursor has poorer outcome it is associated with increased expression of myeloid marker and increased risk of relapse. And in B cell ALN, the mature subtype, which corresponds to the fat classification F3, it is a disseminated form of Barkett's lymphoma and it has poorer outcome. The measurable residual disease. It is the most powerful and the strongest factor in predicting prognosis. The five-year overall survival rate and the risk of relapse is directly related with the residual disease. So the assessment of disease response by MRT stratification is desirable. And we can measure MRT by just following techniques. This includes the polymer strain reaction, multicolor flow cytometry, deep sequencing. As the deep sequencing is not yet available, so the suitable or sensitive method is polymerase chain reaction. The bone marrow splits of peripheral blood both can be used as a source, but the peripheral blood is on to three lot lower than the bone marrow split. So the, so the ideal source is bone marrow split. And regarding timing, it usually varies according to different various treatment regimen, but should generally accept that at the end of induction, 
and or during oscillation therapy, it should be regarded. And the decision regarding the intensification or the intensification of the treatment can be made based on MRT stratification. And it consists of three risk groups. In MRT low risk group, when the day 29 MRT less than 0.005%, and intermediate phase when the day 29 MRT more than 0.005%, but 14 week MRT less than 0.5%, and high risk when the 14 week MRT more than 0.5%. In case of low and intermediate phase, patients should be treated according to chemotherapy regimen, but when they fall in high risk group, they should be treated with hemopoietic steroid cell transplantation. In BSMU, we have conducted two different studies regarding the cytogenetic abnormalities of ALL. In first study, which is done in 2019 to 2020, it was a study the cytogenetic abnormalities of in genome of ALL, and my study population was 36. And based on different cytogenetic abnormalities, the three risk group we received. The uh, favorable risk group was 14%, unfavorable risk group was 25%, and intermediate were 61%. The another study, which was done in 2018 to 2019, the title was The Frequency of BCRPA Positive in a Patient in BSMU, and the study population was 38. And based on presence of BCRPA1, the unfavorable risk group was 37%. So, uh, this is the figure where the cytogenetic pattern of the study population where gain is equal to 36 is shown here, where the most common cytogenetic abnormality that we have found, translocation 922 in 17% case, and the second most abnormalities was translocation 1221 in 11% cases. And based on all these cytogenetic abnormalities, the risk group we have found that favorable risk group were about 14%, unfavorable group was 25% case, and intermediate was 61. This is the figure of the second study where the BCRABL positivity of the study population is shown here. The BCRABL positive case was about 37%. Similar type of study has been conducted in India in 2018, where they found unfavorable risk group in 33% cases and favorable risk group in 23%. In another study, in West India in 2012, they found favorable risk group in 16% cases. In maximum time, we cannot perform the full risk stratification of our patient because we have some limitation. What are those? The first one is limited resource. That is, the financial capability of for most of the patient is on the lower hand. So, the treatment cost is become a burden. So, they cannot perform the uh, stratification with cytogenetic or MRT. It will and another burden for them. The second one is inadequate facilities. That is, the cytogenetic and molecular lab is not yet established in our country. So, we have to rely on effort for these facilities. So, the control of the sample cannot be maintained properly. And the last of all, the poor patient compliance. Sometimes, we fail to able to realize our patient or to motivate our patient to do this costly investigation for full evaluation of the patient. So, this is all about my presentation. Thank you, Tuvan. Thank you, Dr. Minati Parmuti. It was an excellent presentation, elaborated but presented within time. Now, our next topic will be on management of acute lymphoblastic leukemia in adolescent and young adult patients. Our next speaker is a graduate from Solihuma Medical College Hospital and completed her MD hematology under Bangalore Sheikh Mujib Medical University. 
he, she is a very known face and her mission is to be a distinguished voice within the country. And she is Dr. Disha Prezabi. They share her presentation. My respected teachers, my colleagues and our residents, Assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Nisha Mizabin, just completed my daily residency in hematology. I am really honored to be here today for this presentation. My topic is management of ALL in adolescent and young adult patient. First of all, we have to uh, know the defining age group for adolescent and young adult people. This is 15 to 39 years and we all know that the older adults are more than 40 years and we consider the elderly patient uh, of, of more than 65 years. Uh, this is just a recapitulate uh, slide because we all know the general treatment principle that is induction and the backbone is elasparaginous, wind twisting. We also use prednisolone, cyclophosphamide and anthracyclines. And then consolidation that is hydrocytorabine and methotrexate. And maintenance we use orally 6 marcaptopurine, uh, orally MTX, steroid and IV wind twisting and also IT methotrexate. But what is the treatment protocols? Uh, we can uh, subdivide the patients in some group like Philadelphia chromosome negative ALL. In case of adolescent and young adult group, uh, we use in case of Philadelphia chromosome negative ALL, pediatric style intensive multi agent chemotherapy regimen. The commonly used multi agent chemotherapy regimens are BFM, UKLL, KGD, Petema, etc. Why we use in Philadelphia chromosome positive ALL? Obviously, we use the targeted therapy that is thyrosine kinase inhibitor and multi agent chemotherapy, mostly hypersivate, followed by allogenic stem cell transplantation. In case of TLL, the treatment of choice is more, mostly hypersivate, followed by allogenic stem cell transplantation. But in case of TTP negative TLL, we can use melanopin instead of allogenic stem cell transplantation. Uh, sometimes uh, we know that we choose the treatment as the risk stratification, but when there is question of use of multi-agent chemotherapy. Sometimes we feel confused what to choose for an individual patient. And international studies say what about this option. Treatment protocols, we have already mentioned that selected mainly according to the risk stratification. But induction is almost similar for, for all risk groups and in every multi-agent chemotherapy. But there is differences in the consolidation regimen and the doses depend on MRD status. If after induction, the MRD is less than 0.005%, then we can continue as per regimen. But if the MRD is more than 0.005% after induction, we should provide augmented therapy or B induction. The backbone of every protocol are more or less similar to each other, except the dose, drug schedule, timing of MRD testing, such as sometimes we use KGB, which contains pezylated L asparaginase. This is the difference from the other multi agent chemotherapy. Why you use pezylated L asparaginase? Because it's an RV near derivatives, hence the chance of hypersensitivity is low. But as this is pezylated, we have some DA toxicity in this specimen. 
On the other hand, in UKLL, MRD done on day 29, while in BFM, MRD done on day 15 and day 33. There is two time point of MRD testing. There is also changes in schedule, but the newer concept is of more condensed drug dosing. What is the basic difference between pediatric and adult protocols? Children have more critical trials, disease biology or drug resistance mechanism in adult cannot be ruled out. Treatment related toxicity and mortality is less in children. Then why we use the pediatric based treatment in adolescent and young adult? Various studies suggest that Adolescent and young adult age group can tolerate the pediatric regimen also. We know that the uh, CR rate in pediatric age group is uh, more or less 80%. But in case of adolescent and young adult, the CR rate is 30 to 40% only. But after using the pediatric based regimen in the IR group, there is an increase in the rate of complication regimen in this age group also. Now, the newer treatment and the targeted therapy. We all know that Philadelphia chromosome positive ALL we use tyrosine kinase inhibitor. In case of T3O and 5I mutation, we can use monotinib. In case of CD20 positive ALL, we use rituximab. And BCR ABL1 like gene positive, we can use TKI and rusolitinib can be used also sometimes. <laughs> Well, I want to say some uh, points about BCR ABL1 like acute lymphoblastic leukemia in this uh, slide because nowadays it's a great challenge because uh, BCR ABL1 like gene positive ALL are uh, in high risk group and it's very much difficult to treat and remain a patient in complete CR. Uh, the uh, BCR ABL1 like gene can al uh, alter two pathways that is. Uh, tyrosine kinase pathway and also Jackistate pathway. In ABL class lesion, the genes are ABL1, ABL2, PTGFRB, PTGFRA, and CSF1R. While in the Jackistate family, we have CRLF2, CR, uh, and IL7R. In case of Jackistate uh, pathway dysregulation, we can use ruxolitinib, and in case of ABL class lesion, we use the TKI. The other uh, targeted therapy or the newer agents are clofarabine, melarabine, vinpristin liposomal, linatumumab, inotuzumab, and tisagenial leucel, which is a cartisal therapy. Uh, what is the indication for allogenic stem cell transplantation? The high risk patient and relapse and refractory cases. My second presenter will uh, discuss and elaborately on this topic. Now, some international data about the effectiveness of various kind of treatment protocol, that is the different use of multi-agent chemotherapy. A single central study in Saudi Arabia on BFM protocol shows that was published in Blood Journal in 2012, 87% patient achieved complete remission, Five-year DFA disease-free survival rate was 37%, and five-year overall survival was 35%. Treatment-related mortality was 8%. A single center study in Portugal on hypersevered protocol shows, which was published in PubMed in 2015, 91% patient achieved complete CR, complete remission. Five-year disease-free survival was 39%, and overall survival was 38%. Treatment-related mortality was 6%. And a single center study uh, in Saudi Arabia on KGP and UKLL protocol shows by University of Health Science Jeddah, KGP uh, protocol, in case of KGP protocol, seven years overall survival was 46%, and in UKLL, five-year overall survival was 45%. And what is the problem in uh, case in our country? As we have no data regarding our treatment outcome, uh, I, I will mention few cases. 
Uh, practically, we feel the complication during our uh, normal treatment protocol in our center. Uh, I have uh, you know, four cases here, and uh, these are from PSMMO hematology department. Is one a 19 years old male. Uh, he was came into our hospital with fever and left knee joint pain. On examination, we found anemia, parvitinic spot, and hepatomegaly. And diagnosis was made by uh, on the basis of PDF, immunophenotyping, and cytogenetics. That was Philadelphia chromosome negative ALF. And treatment was decided to give BFM protocol. We have completed the protocol and also maintenance is completed. The outcome, he is in complete revision now. My second case, a 23 years old male. He was admitted in BSMM with fever and neck swelling. On examination, we found anemia, lymphadenopathy, and diagnosis was made as TALL. And treatment was decided to give hypersipat, but the outcome, uh, death due to profound cytopenia and neutropenic fever after completion of six cycles of chemotherapy. My third case, a 35 years old female. She came with fever and history of two unit blood transfusion. On examination, we found anemia and lymphadenopathy. Diagnosis was Philadelphia chromosome negative ALL, and we started BFM protocol. But we were compelled to discontinue the chemo protocol during consultation because she developed pancreatitis and proximal myopathy. And palliative treatment was decided to give, but the outcome was death after two years of diagnosis. And for today, my last case, a 30 years old male. Uh, he was came with fever and neck swelling. On examination, we found anemia, lymphadenopathy, echinosis. Diagnosis was Philadelphia chromosome positive ALL. So we started TKI with hypersivet. And the outcome was death just after first cycle due to neutropenic sepsis and sudden profound hematemesis. So considering these complications, we have the new hematologist or the young hematologist has the queries that what to do when we can't continue the protocol perfectly due to complications? And what would be the outcome when we need to modify the doses and maintain our individualized schedules due to the complications? Why hypersivet regimen cannot be completed successfully in most of the institute in Bangladesh? And lastly, can we follow a same protocol in every center for a particular disease? Thank you everyone for the patient's hearing. Thank you, Dr. Nisha. It was a very informative presentation on sharing your journey so we can avert our pitfalls that lie ahead. Now, I will invite my third present, uh, presenter. He is Dr. Kaji Mohammad Khanu Islam a recent fellow of PCPS in hematology and energetic young hematologist who graduated from Sir Solibunga Medical College Hospital and currently working in the Department of Hematology of the Madhu Sheikh Modi Medical University. Assalamu alaikum, honorable chairperson of this session, respective teachers, learned audience, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome you all of this day's scientific session. I am very much grateful to Hematu Society of Bangladesh to give me the opportunity to present here. I must congratulate all the newly elected members of the Hematology Society of Bangladesh. Today, my topic is advanced treatment options of relapsed ALM in adults. 
which one is relapse rate? It is refractory. According to the FCCI 2020, relapse disease means reappearance of blast in peripheral blood or bone marrow more than 5% or in any extramural site after a complete remission. Refractory disease means failing to achieve complete remission at the end of induction therapy. We all know that there is poor outcomes in patients with relapse and refractory ALR. The MRC UKLL2 study outcome of patients after first relapse, five years overall survivability is 7% and LALA 94 study outcome of patients after first relapse, second year, uh, two year overall survivability is 11% and five years overall survivability is 8%. Now I'm, uh, I'm now presenting some cases. Case one, a 65 year old patient with Philadelphia negative MRD positive ALL at the end of hyper one week induction cycle. What would be the further treatment options? It could be Renatumumab. It is a bi-specific T cell engager. In the last study, that is a phase two trial, which is approved by FDA on March, March 2018, includes Philadelphia negative BLM, adult patients received three or more chemotherapy blocks of standard ALL protocol and in complete remission. MRD positivity is more than 0.1% using an assay with a minimum sensitivity of 0.01%. Here, the real to is used 28 microgram per day, day 1 to day 28, up to 4 cycle. There is the MRD negativity is about about, 80, about 82 percent, and median relapse risk survivability of bilateral in this study is 54 percent at 18 months. We all know that Renatumab is a bispecific T cell engager which acts against CD3 and CD19 expressed by LL blast cell that activates the T cell, redirects it to cytotoxicity of tumor cell and subsequently causes tumor cell death. It also proliferates the T cell to improve the effector target. During the course of renal tumor, we must closely monitor the patient as it causes the grade 3 and 4 toxicity, including pyrexia, neurotoxicity, and cytokine losing symptoms. It causes about 53% of the patients with neurotoxicity among those 13 patients, uh, patients have grade 3 and 4 neurotoxicity. In case two, a 55-year-old patient with primary refractory Philadelphia negative BLL and a 25-year-old patient with relapsed BLL during maintenance treatment what with the further treatment options. That could be uh, that could be used bilateral or standard chemotherapy. In our study, which is a phase three trial, which is approved by FDA on, on July 2016, includes Philadelphia negative BALL. There's a randomized trial, includes the adult patients, primary refractory disease, untreated first relapse with first remission less than 12 months, untreated second or lateral relapse, and post BMT relapse. With the with the Briatumab, the Briatumab, the median overall survivability is seven seven point seven months, and uh, and uh, with the standard chemotherapy, it is four months, and overall uh, survival the time of stem cell transposition with the median overall survivability is six point nine months, and uh, with the standard chemotherapy, it is three point nine months. 
with the bedroom map MRD negative B, with the bedroom map is 76.5% and the standard chemotherapy that is 48%. That is statistically significant. There is no effective in most of the subgroups here, but when the tumor burden is increased, that is the blood cell percentage is more than 50%. Then the response rate between the bilateral and the standard chemotherapy, it was very close. On the tower study, it showed the bilateral have lesser adverse effect with the comparison to standard chemotherapy, including infections, cytopenia, and other side effects. But with the bilateral it causes the cytokine release syndrome, which is not seen in the standard chemotherapy. The, the second option of these cases, that is ironosumab ozogamycin, which acts against CD22 and standard chemotherapy. In innovative study, includes the relapse PLM of adult patients, uh, adult patients age over 18 years of age with relapse of refractory BLL, relapse after one to, to induction chemotherapy for ALL, philadelphia positive BLL, precursor ALL, relapse after at least TKI and standard chemotherapy. <coughs> Here the ironosomab group, the complete remission rate is 80.7%, but the standard chemotherapy group, the response rate is 29.4%. The MRD negativity with ironosumab, that is 78.4%, and with the standard chemotherapy, then that was 28.1%, that is statistically significant. Ironosumab is also effective in most of the subgroups. In comparison with the bilateral and the ironosumab, here we showed that the bilateral where the uh, tumor burden is uh, increased, it, it is closer to the response rate to the chemotherapy, uh, standard chemotherapy group, but the aridosumab is effective when also, when the tumor burden is also increased. The third option is that is cellular therapy, CAR-T cell therapy, the FDA approved drug is Isagen uh, Lecusil, the survival rate at six months is 67 percent, and the, the probable essential uh, uh, eventual survival rate is uh, at six months is 67 percent, and overall overall survivability is overall survivability is at six months at 78 percent. In case of cellular therapy, it causes the long-term survivability. My third case, a 65-year-old patient with Philadelphia positive ALL with relapse. We all know that in case of Philadelphia positive ALL, we usually use imaginary or designated along with the standard chemotherapy. But when in, in course of time of uh, uh, relapse of uh, Philadelphia positive ALL, uh, there, there may be, a, a, there, we must do the ABL guided nutrition uh, to diagnose the next step mutation like TG15I. Yeah, that is the emergence of this resistant mutation, we should use ponatine. Now, what are the other options other than the standard chemotherapy? It may be the brinatumab, iridizumab, or other combinations of immunotherapy and TKI. In Alcantara study for Philadelphia positive ALL, it includes the adult patient, relapse and refractory to at least one second generation or later generation, uh, generation TKIs, intolerant to second generation TKIs, and, into, and intolerant and refractory to imaginary precise. In, in, uh, we can use ironosumab in case of Philadelphia positive relapsed ALL 
and it is uh, it is same response as Philadelphia and Haiti that I have shown earlier in this presentation. In case for a 50 year old patient with relapsed TALR during the first year of maintenance therapy. What are the currently available strategies of to treat a TALR and relapse? What are the well-known clinical trials? This is the most frustrating part of the treating to relapse TALR. That is, we really are lost in good options. There are only two MPA approved drugs, that is nelorabin and liposomal vincristin. With nelorabin, with the use of nelorabin, the relapse survivability and overall survivability is increased. That is, the over, with nelorabin, overall, uh, overall complete remission at 26%, partial res response at 23%, video duration of Complete remission is 4.1 to 273 weeks. Median duration of disease free survivability is 11 to 56 weeks. And uh, median duration of overall survivability that is 30 to 36 weeks and survival at one year that is 15%. But we should closely monitor the patient during the treatment of nelorabine as about 70% of the patient with nelorabine it causes severe neurotoxicity. It causes the sensory neuropathy uh, along with tingling numbness and also severe motor neuropathy. Sometimes patients experience unable to walk, so we should closely monitor the patient during the treatment of neurology. We can also use the liposomal link testing uh, in case of relapsed GLL. The overall complete remission is 20%, median overall survivability is 4.6 months and median overall survival patients who are transplanted in complete remission is 8.9 months. The mainly three new agents for relapse and refractory ALR, the journey started to clear to man that is on 2014 with adults, adult patients with relapse and refractory being the other. Then it, it, imposed in children with relapse and refractory PBL and finally approved the APA by March 2018. I'm to which is approved on 2017 and the cellular therapy decision that is approved on 2017. What is the choice of therapy for relapse PBL? Bilirubin is used in any ages Ironuzumab usually is used in adult patients and carbon cell therapy used in pediatric and young adults usually less than 25 years of age. Efficacy with Bilantumab that is complete remission is 36 to 44 percent with Ironuzumab that is 58 to 80 percent and carbon cell therapy that is 81 to 93 percent. Bilantumab is used when the disease burden is low. Ironuzumab is used either disease burden is low or high, and cardiac therapy is usually used when the disease burden is low. The toxicity is the bilirubin and the cellular therapy is the neurotoxicity, main toxicity, neurotoxicity and cytokine release syndrome. Uh, but, but with ironuzumab, the main toxicity is liver toxicity, that the venoclosal disease. That is the options of adults with relapse and refractory BALL. This tower study, we compared the tower study, event study, and LIR study. Tower study, we use bilantumab with the overall response with 44%. And innovative study, we use anusumab, that the overall response is 81%. And LIR study, that is a phase two trial, it is used at decidedly like you said, is 81%. MRD negativity with bilantumab, that is 76%. Ironuzumab 78% and Tisagen Lecusin 100%. Median, median overall survival with Ironuzumab is 7.7 months. Ironuzumab with 7.7 months also. And, and the safety measure, safe and toxicity that is I mentioned earlier. This is all about my presentation. Thanks for your patience here. Oh, that was such a mature 
and wonderful presentation. Thank you, Dr. Kazimogna Kamalusna, with best wishes. Now, let's move to our last topic, that is bone marrow transplantation in acute lymphoblastic leukemia patient. And a little introduction for our last speaker. He is a medicine specialist, a graduate of Anshin Medical College Hospital, Hospital, Medical College, and done his MCPS in 2015, became fellow of BCPS in internal medicine since 2016. And we are very lucky that he has shown interest and completed her in his MD hematology in this year from Dhaka Medical College. Please welcome Dr. Mohammad Mangubul Alam. Donor. 
Next, unrelated donor may be sought from the donor registry, that may be national or international one. Capital identification of next unrelated donor may be considered if the increased list of procedures are accepted. The cytomegal virus status is very much important and it should be positive for the uh, positive recipient and donor should be negative for negative recipient. Heavily P transfuse patient should be a new blood group match. Uh, now the donor cell source, unrelated or related. Previously, outcome of mass unrelated were inferior to mass sibling donor. But nowadays, improvements in the donor recipient LED mass matching a distance of validity. And the CPSD prophylaxis and the very much effective supportive care solves this issue. Uh, if there is two study, one revealed a retrospective uh, analysis of higher DSP survival from best sibling donor, best unrelated donor, and revealed 45 percent higher survival in contrast to 42% in mass related donor. Another study revealed that four year overall survival was not different between the related versus unrelated donor. Thus, the unrelated donors are a reasonable option in whom related donors are not available. What are the alternative to erogenic stem cells also? The alternative are haplo or umbilical cord blood, and another is otolugas. In case of pediatric age group, haplo or, haplo or umbilical cord blood is established, but the data is evolving in case of adult age group. Otolugas transplantation is not standard in ALN, but they be a good option in MRD negative. High risk patients, those are not eligible for allogenic acid. It also safe and effective in Philadelphia positive ALN without massive donor. The key transfer investigations included the hematological, biochemical, virological, immunological, microcardiac function test, and molecular testing. In addition to donors, recipients are studied lung function test. Cytogenic abnormalities in large panel, dental review, and cyclic evaluation. The conditioning agent used in allogenic transplant are myoviabilitic or reduced intensity conditioning. The myoviabilitic conditioning regimen uh, is by the, either on total body radiation based or chemotherapy based. In the East Asian patient, the uh, appropriate conditioning element it is still to be established, but a Korean study demonstrated TBI therapy may be an appropriate or best for the younger generation. But the another study it will have to publish chemotherapy regimen for adult risk group. But the main outcome was comparable to other regimens. The available myelinated measurements are total body irradiation and combination of cyclomostomite, it is the standard one, but the busulfan and cyclomostomite is well comparable to the before regimen by overall survival, response rate and disease free survival. So advantage in the substituting of etoposite for cyclomostomite or cyclomostomite with increased dose of total body radiation has the same type of response. Now the reduced intensity conditioning. It is yet to be defined in the younger generation. Beta comes with RIC that is down versus leukemia effect. It, it, it helps to eradicate the leukemia and lower the relapse rate of GPSD. EBMT study found increased relapse rate, but non-relapse mortality is reduced. So reduced intensity conditioning is inadequate for Q. But a reasonable option in advanced stage and in comorbid conditions. The complications of MACT are established transplant related mortality, 
neutropenic sepsis is a dangerous one. Graft process host disease may be in acute form or chronic form. Seizure may occur from the conditioning agent such as busulfur. The catering may be due to chemotherapy agent or steroid or radiation. There may be endocrinopathy. And there is a chance of secondary malignancy such as skin malignancy. And the dangerous one is post transplant lip fetish disorder such as PTLD. It is caused by abstain by virus. And the last one is psychological disturbance. Follow up and post transplant surveillance. Is immunosuppressive therapy slightly long needed? Answer is no. Immunosuppressive therapy is withdrawn at the third month and ultimately should be discontinued at the six month. The patient should be prophylaxis for viral therapy by asymptomy and bacterial therapy for antibacterial therapy by penicillin or cold time of surgery. If there is penicillin allergy, the patient should be treated with rhizomycin. And the patient physical condition should be monitored by practicing good oral hygiene. The patient should take medical medicine medication for antibiotic and notice pyrexia and treated. The patient is closely monitored up to 100 days for the adjustment, transfusion requirements, drug versus host disease, cytomegalomer status, treatment related side effects, timerism, psychosocial, and relapse. After 100 days, the patient should be follow-up in, in little bit wider rates, that is four to eight weekly for first year and then extended interval if there is no subsequent complications. Routinely, twice a week, some blood industries are done and weekly perform some other tests. When the patient should be discharged? When the patient can intake fluid about two to three liters per day and tolerate diet, medication, especially oral cyclosporin or technolimus, and the hematological parameters such as hemoglobin more than 10 gram per deciliter, Absolute due to be count more than 1,000 and the village more than 25,000. Prevention of relapse after aerogenic ACT, it is about to establish. In case of relatively positive patient, post transplant DKA should be therapy in 90 days. Optimal duration not yet been determined. Some advocate as long as the patient can tolerate it, but some other, some other advocate duration of one year. Uh, but the PCR can positive status in case the relapse rate. Now the treatment of relapse. The available options for post allergenic transplant relapse are donor demosal infusion, second transplant if the patient is capable or, or tolerate, and the last one is palliative treatment. A study limited chemotherapy followed by second transplant and non transplant had the uh, had no statistically significant difference. Now the alternative to the transplant, the immunotherapy based on MT CD fifty two, that is LM2 jumet, and the MT CD twenty two, that is IMO jumet, or by specific T cell engagers, that is dinatomide, are the immunotherapy alternatives. RT cell therapy is under development after success in use of CLN and the novel agents such as Nelanamine is a good option. I took help from these references and take two messages are only high risk T cell or B cell ALL are provided indication for allergenic transplant, positive MRD even after transplant or chemotherapy has most outcome even after allergenic transplant. And in future, novel targeted agents such as Dinatomobat, Cartesalum therapy, or Nelabi may replace allergenic stem cell transplant. Thank you for patient hearing and thanks to Hematology Society of Bangladesh. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Mohammad Mahmoud for your practical experiences. And with it, we have completed our speaker's speech. So I'd like to humbly request our chairperson and other panelists to take the time.
এই মুহূর্তে আমি শত ঠাকুরে স্মরণ করছি বিগত বছরে আমরা যাতে হারিয়েছি ব্রিগেডিয়ার জেনারেল এ কে আবু ইউসুফ খান স্যার কর্নেল প্রফেসর মোহাম্মদ মনিরুজ জামান স্যার ফেস বি রেসিডেন্ট সাচে ইয়াং সোর ডক্টর শামিম ইয়াংগার ব্রাদার অফ আওয়ার রেসপেক্টেড প্রফেসর সালাউদ্দিন শাহ স্যার মাদার অ্যান্ড টু ব্রাদার্স অফ প্রফেসর সালমা আকরোজ ম্যাডাম may allah grant them jannatul firdaus and patience to the family to bear their loss they are our fallen heroes and always be remembered next we will go to the question answer session so dear audience floor is yours you may ask questions to our four speakers they will give the answer please name the speaker's name and your name before asking the question due to the time constraint we will allow just a few questions four to five and if you have any personal interest or further question you can ask to the panelists or the speakers in the tea break time thank you any question from the audience কারণ
and this machine's uh, VFM protocol can fifty percent faster than hyper that than this machine is prepared for the allogenic transfer transformation. This is the successful allogenic expansion transplantation in mathematical college about six thousand transplantations. But what I want to say what effort we can do for these patients. One of my doctors, he said, Tim Mashmu Sutine, with the eye bell, the mute she was done. With the Amar unit, that is. Pamim, Pamim is present, is there? So, devotion is the main thing to treat the patients up to the marks of treatment. Uh, it's a hematological excellence. It is possible in Bangladesh. But uh, it's a devotion and everyday care is necessary. Yes. Next, another uh, seven presenter. VFM protocol, three patients is died from the standard VFM protocol or the augmented VFM protocol. Uh, sir, I have shown uh, three uh, patients who died. Uh, two of them were after uh, modified BFM protocol was given, and one was after hypersimmet. Yes, uh, modified uh, every protocol can be modified by the senior hematologist. Uh, in Dhaka Medical College, you could have three protocols in the CDFM protocol, and pediatric is the cancer protocol in the, the UK, LL. Uh, 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 12 protocols or 10, 10 protocols for the poor patients. Uh, it, it is the modified one, and uh, uh, the uh, treatment uh, is uh, uh, more or less is the same for all the patients. But what do you think the the what the risk factors now in, in increasingly rise as a patient's person? Uh, information of the risk factor for a patient for the treatment risk factors, patients' information. Sir, patients' information uh, regarding this factor, I am not sure that 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 I am not sure becomes one of the risk factors for the management of the disease. Oh, no, sir. In these cases, there was not such a uh, condition because all of them were uh, young, uh, of young ages, and uh, the body structure was uh, normal. Um, but uh, in case of female, we uh, show the pancreatitis after the inspiration is given. And uh, the young patient who was uh, 19 years old, uh, he has uh, no such comorbidities or any uh, uh, mentionable complication of his own. How do you uh, treat these patients with uh, L as far as it is? You know, one of the complications you noted that are uh, one of pancreatitis. Another uh, uh, complication that any type of hemorrhage complications or any thrombotic complications that you think. Uh, you, you observed in your patients? Uh, okay, sir. One patient was uh, due to hemorrhagic complication, but who developed pancreatitis. Uh, he was, uh, she was a female, and uh, uh, after the pancreatitis, we were compelled to uh, discontinue the uh, discontinue the protocol, and we started palliative, and uh, but the palliation uh, did not respond as well. Can I request everybody? Yes. So, may I ask a question? Please. I want to take the opportunity you in the dais. So first question to you, and it was a fantastic presentation. You mentioned that MRT level is 0.005%. That is too low. What is the tools that can be identified as such a low level of MRT positivity? Thank you, ma'am, for your question. Uh, as I have taken the information from International Journal, 
most of them use uh, in, uh, to detect MRT, they use NGS. Uh, so uh, uh, the current value is so low. NGS is not available in every country. Yeah. Uh, in, uh, most referral centers they use the NGS now. So we can uh, mention the MRT level 10 to the power minus 4, that is the uh, standard for us to detect. Uh, thank you so much for your answer. May I ask another question to Dr. Mahu? Thank you. Um, he has also, all the four speakers very deliberately, very nicely, and uh, literally they are very nicely delivered. They are in the, presentation, but Dr. Mahmoud, I want to know that you mentioned the myeloability, chemotherapy or conditioning therapy, like TBI and blue sulfur and blue and psi. But there is excellent another myeloability conditioning chemotherapy that is known as reduced, not reduced intensity, rather it is called reduced toxicity myeloability conditioning chemotherapy, that is RTM. That is the blue and flu. That is a very good option and comparable to TBI uh, continuing uh, conditioning chemotherapy and also the uh, B1 side conditioning chemotherapy. So it, it is, uh, I just want to mention you, uh, do you have uh, any comment on uh, busulfan and fludorabine? Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Uh, the alternative options are many. They are, are, are Total body irradiation is basically based for ALN, but some other regimens such as busulfan based, that is busulfan may be combined to cyclosomite, busulfan may be combined to fludarabin also, and uh, cyclosan may be replaced by uh, etoposite also. So there are many other type of conditioning regimens in many setups. I want to add you that there is not uh out of chemotherapy for conditioning chemotherapy, only four or five drugs along with the uh, TBI is the only myeloablative. So if we want to give the myeloablative the patient, the TBI is most mostly effective for lymphoblastic or lymphoid malignancies, but it has certain risk of uh, tissue toxicity in terms of GBHD. So that, that uh, hampers the outcome in terms of oral survival and disease free survival also. So we can think of uh, blue, blue and flu because uh, this is comparable nowadays. It is considering as a comparable outcome. Uh, thank you. I, I think uh, the panelist also will add on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was a wonderful question and answer session. And our panel of experts will further discuss about the uh, speakers today and about the topic today. I will request our first panelist, Professor Dr. Akhil Ranjan Vishnash, who has passed his MBBS from Rampur Medical College. Oh, sorry. Yes, one course is from that. I'm already. 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 I'm High risk so we have to chemotherapy regime and transplant application. So, we have to the risk the treatment protocol, treatment choice, counseling. So, we have to speaker. We have to Punchasha Thank 
He is a IHTC fellow, CMC fellow, and now the professor and head of the department of hematology and EMT unit, Dhaka Medical College. He is always enthusiastic to evaluate the critical cases of hematology, especially in anemia, bleeding disorder, multiple myeloma, acute leukemia, and now on bone marrow transplantation. He is also the pioneer of modern coagulation lab in Dhaka Medical College Hospital. Professor Dr. Okti Roger Bishas, please, sir. Thank you, Julia, for your kind words. Uh, 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 first, uh, I must uh, admit that uh, I am not a, an expert at all in the field of hematology, and I'm a humble learner. And from today's program, a great achievement for me is that I realized that I need to study much more and uh, give much more time in studying hematology. I just emphasize one thing first, that even hydrogen steel uh, can be rusted without use. Every day we uh, go, come up with lots of information in the field of hematology and other science, and we can't apply it properly in our place. So we forget the value. And from Dr. Kamal's presentation, we found that actually first chance is the best chance for the treatment of ALL and all other hematological malignancies. Most first chance is the best chance. So we have to make it best uh, for first injection. And here we come through the information that in most cases, the treatment related mortality in our country is very high because the condition where we are treating the patient. We are lacking of the best supportive care, best hospital facility, and best nursing care, and best lab facility, which are needed for treating heart disease patients, including acute infarctal leukemia. So we have to decide from here that we should not offer intensive chemotherapy treatment for the head or AML in common ward and crowded place, where we may kill the patient rather than curing the leukemia. We have to make it documented how many people are going to be cured with the intensive chemotherapy in a crowded world against the chance of mortality due to neutropenic sepsis or bleeding or uh, some other complication, uh, organ, multi-organ failure, uh, uh, disability intravascular coagulation, is cerebral uh, complication, thrombosis, etc., etc. This is high tech because we are really giving the induction chemotherapy or any type of intensive chemotherapy we are getting from the books and from the reference, but we are we are not being able to offer the facility, hospital facility, nursing facility, and the facility. facility. Uh, then I want to Okay. Emphasize one thing from the Nishad's presentation. Uh, Nishad uh, in some place told that uh, with hypersever disease free survival of 39%, but overall survival is 38%. I think it was a different time point because, because in disease free survival cannot be ish longer than overall survival. I think it was a different time period. Like disease free survival was probably three years and overall survival was probably four years. And thank you so much for sharing and I request uh, my seniors here for commenting the, the next time. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Our next panel will expert to speak is Dr. Abu Jafar Mohammad Saleh. He has joined in Apollo Hospital, Dhaka, as a senior consultant and coordinator of hematology and stem cell transplant department since November 2014. He has more than nine years of working experience in Kin Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center, the pioneer of first ever woman transplantation in private sector of Bangladesh. He is currently working in various fields of hematology, especially leukemia, lymphoma, multiple myeloma, and bone marrow transplantation. Dr. Abu Jafar Mohammad Thank you very much. The time is short, so the, my points will be very precise. And I feel uh, very happy uh, to be here and uh, highly honored and privileged. Uh, after this today's discussion, uh, one thing is uh, in my mind that, uh, you know, first thing we have to establish a national guideline for the ALL 
we have been discussing few days and i think we can start from the llm because we discussed today we heard that four steps in llm management so what is the benefit of establishing a guideline i know we will not be biased you know uh, we will talk in a same tone so the patients will not be biased because the, when a patient is diagnosed as leukemia they go to different consultants and they get different information they lose their confidence they go abroad but whenever we talk in the same language then the patient's confidence will be there so the patient will stay the second uh, importance of making a guideline is you know sometimes we think that it's uh, we criticize each other because i might like bfm my sir can like others can like hypercivet so we can uh, whenever we differ a patient thinks that that we are criticizing each other so that will be stopped so this is very important <coughs> and then we know what are the supports that uh, to be needed we know that our infrastructure it is developing and uh, ALL, you know i wondered that uh, the one important issue is blood banking support the cryo precipitate all ALL protocols they need uh, l-aspirogenase and l-aspirogenase it costs a lot of consumes a lot of cryo precipitate and I don't know how many hospitals are ready to support with this crowd precipitate because in my personal experience, uh, we are using in our department, we are using more than 800 units of crowd per year. So it's a huge amount. And uh, all the speakers, they showed their courage just passed and the way they presented is brilliant. And uh, all the participants, they were focusing on the discussion. And we discussed from the basic to the top uh, the society has to take initiative to bring in some of the medications. Like uh, we are uh, talking about transplant, most of the transplant medications are not available. It is very difficult to bring in our country in an authentic way. Uh, we know about Nilarabin. I just completed one patient, Nilarabin. This is the 52 years old doctor, and he uh, failed hypersemen and other protocols, but he responded very well in the first cycle of Nilarabin and it was brought from UK. Anyway, so with this uh, issue, I will uh, hand over uh, my microphone to my uh, seniors and uh, nothing special because of short of time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Every point of your speech is special, really. And now our next expert is Professor Pablo Mosdaludin. Sir graduated from Chitaka Medical College Hospital Medical College. And after joining in Bangladesh Army, he has done MCPS, TCP, and FCPS in hematology. He is a clinical fellow from NUH Singapore at Tata Memorial Center at Calcutta and a BMT expert. Currently, he is working and, uh, and also he is one of the pioneers of starting the BMT in both autologous and allogenic in combined military hospital Dhaka. He is the head of the BMT unit in combined military hospital Dhaka. Professor Pavel Mosul. Thank you very much for inviting me as a panel expert. The first speaker is stratification of area. I think the professor told us no pressure. High count in the typical is high risk. But what is it? It's about the low count and narrow pack with the focused uniform. Of course, in addition to the count, there's another, uh, another characteristic which then vital role in the as discussed by the speaker. Mainly such as it is immunotherapy by the mature carriers, back prognosis, cytogenetics, transformation, four level, nine to two, I would break. These all factors play vital role in stratification and could manage the adult patient depending. That category and categorized by risk stimulation. And in third speaker, the special speaker talked about the management of relapsed area. Actually, it is the nightmare for the hematologist in case of relapsed area. There is no standard counter management for relapsed disease, although a few agents are approved for using this issue. Mainly, immunotherapy here plays a vital and tremendous role in. Treating this relapse in refractory error, uh, linear to move up, that is, which is directed against both target or against the target antibody CD19 and CD3 tissues. 
and milagrin is very much effective in case of relapsed T allergy. You know, like this one, green tea also approved for relapse disease. Some surface chemo, like, uh, is very much effective in flag affiliated, like flag adapt, flag adapt, flag, or dofalabin based surface regimen can be used. Antibody, mainly antibody therapy is very much essential and plays an important role in treating the relapse in refractory error. Such, such as Ophatumumab, which is an DC deflective antibody that binds different effects than redox and Alemtuzumab, and other is Ozonomycin. Ozonomycin acts on CD20 component. And finally, a chimeric and rhythm separate some therapy is very much effective in treating the relapse pair. The fourth speaker told about the allergenic transplantation error patients. According to question of Dr. Mafruha, my laboratory is mainly young, young adult patients in relapse failure. We, can, we use it when it is of preferred product, side DBI or GUSA. But in comorbid condition in a big aged patient, Pogio can be used as a laboratory agent. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk this forum. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next panel of experts is Professor Dr. Mahbubur Rahman. Sir graduated from Dhaka Medical College, passed his FCBS within a short time, and he has served as a clinician and mentor in Chittagong Medical College and Hospital for several years. He has a FACP and FRCP. He has established the hematology department in National Institute of um, Cancer Research and Hospital and currently working as the professor and head of the same department. He has a vast knowledge and experience of working with various cases of lymphoma, myeloma, and acute leukemia. He is always working for the betterment of the society and he is still the current president of Society of Hematology Bangladesh and also the ex chairman faculty of hematology PCPS. Professor Dr. Mahmoud Thank you, Dr. Zulfia Shonalche. Actually, Zulfia Arabane touch for it, so I don't know if you wish to So, I next I'm So, i I'm general speaker. I'm general speaker. I mean, is it actually a commercial expert? I hate to be an expert. Rather, I am very rather I would say I love to be a learner. The problem is both I and the motion of my expert. I mean, you don't want to go in. I'm a central hospital. Catch for it. Bangladesh shop. I will take a patient as a patient. I low income group, middle income group. I will take a patient So, that is management. I will take a patient. 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 I will take a Good to the patient. I have no right to do harm to any patient. He is only put me on the patient of an asset. She couldn't have a particular of the function of the risk stratification about accordingly, even a direct protocol is for a social shamba for him. You don't know how the motor code is. I'm a child of the high. So he pointed every morning is there. Cosmo Ricatina, Dr. Michel, Marjorie, J. Amra Amadek Nichas Shepta, common protocol, Amadi to the German, it upon the Paritina. Ami Monitor, this is a time, right there, we must do it. Amadek Nijita Atashamaji pick up at Amadek protocol, the Yukaradanka, the Bomb, Ashakoshi, the Immortal Society, or Bangladesh Mutunji Communication, the Yukaradanka, the Yukaradanka, 
we could not use healthy fungal and higher antibiotics for the patient. So most of our patients used to die. Now the treatment protocol, here in the treatment protocol, uh, actually this is to be decided initially after this stratification. Professor Mahmoud said very well that we should know the minimum risk factors that the patient, whether it is diesel, LL or diesel number Number two, whether he or she is blood if you are positive or negative. The other criteria that we can see is the product count. And the patients who are solvent, we can advise them for further investigation like cytogenetics. And then we'll have to decide which protocol we choose. Is it BFM? Is it effective? Is it NGB? Is it Lima? Uh, is it Hyperspray? So, and uh, if it is in institutional practice, I think there should be a board. The mission with all the investigation to be placed to the board. And the board will decide which protocol to be chosen for the patient. And accordingly, we will treat the patient. And we will also assess the financial ability of the patient. If the patient is not financially solvent, we should not go for any particular protocol which is expensive, which needs support. And if the patient cannot give the support, then what will happen? We will die. The same thing is happening. At some time or other, the patient says, No, I have no, no, no more capability. We will contribute for the antibiotics, for the uh, products, GCSF, and other drugs. So at, at that point, there is no other way other than killing the patient. So <clears throat> I think, first, our assessment is risk. Stratification is very nicely. Uh, the first speaker, Dr. Anantipa, is stated. So, minimum assessment tools, that means minimum investigation we should do, and we should stratify the patient, and we should sit together, if it's institution, that what protocol we will give, and we should follow that after assessing the financial ability of the patient. Another very important issue is that our patients cannot be kept in isolation. Now, I have a patient in my clinic with multiple myeloma. She is a female. Our daughter is doctor, son-in-law is doctor, and some other related, there are four or five of us behind the patient. And there are four or five attendants inside the cabinet. And I requested so much. So, yeah, doctor, we know what. So, <clears throat> the patient cannot be the talent. I see this soon. So, this is the scenario <clears throat> that maintenance of isolation is very difficult in our care. And if she cannot maintain the isolation, the infection, contamination, transfer infection is very And other thing is that if the patient is assessed and is found to be high expression, I think we should not go for higher protocol. We cannot cure the patient. So the option should be either we will continue the full treatment with the full protocol, and if needed, we will go, go for the normal transplant. So, if the patient cannot, I think he should be given palliative care. So, I think this, this uh, stratification and making a guideline for the country and also the making awareness of the patient and their attendants for good outcome in, in the time evenly, I think, the issue. So, I think everybody should think about the guideline and about
protocol of what to eat and what not to eat. And we are taking the patients and their attendants about the treatment of procedure. And finally, I hope this amount of the society uh, will take up this responsibility to make a guideline, a school guideline, and uh, will follow, the will follow, try to follow. And another final uh, request is that the government has taken initiative to issue health insurance. And our the most weak, weakest point I mean, I mean to say is that we, we are not under the coverage of insurance. So we cannot spend any money for any patient. So these patients should be under medical insurance. The insurance company will pay any amount that is in your population. If this situation comes to Bangladesh, I think that it will start easy in the Thank you, sir. Very really expert opinion. I'm so sorry that the time is your opinions. Thank you again. And before our concluding remarks from Professor Jalil Rahman sir, I would like to add uh, to you to the audience that there is a last topic on a novel oral iron chiloter therapy, therapy which is, will be delivered by Dr. Porimon Talukdar. Just have patience for 10 to 15 minutes. After that, we will go to a tea break. So now I would like to hear the concluding remarks from our today's chairperson, Professor Mohammad Jalil Rahman. प्रचुर
আর আজকে যে প্রোগ্রামটা এতে সুপারকে আমি বলতে চাই যে আমি এই কাবিন সোসাইটির কাছে রিকোয়েস্ট রাখব যে এই প্রোগ্রামগুলো যেন আমাদের সব জায়গায় হয় নট ইন দা ঢাকা ইটা কন্টিনেন্টাল নট ইন দা ঢাকা মিডল পাস নট ইন দা এজিয়ান এর ডিফারেন্স অঙ্গমিডল পাস বিভিন্ন জায়গায় এটা হতে হবে এবং সেটা চেষ্টা করতে হবে আমাদেরকে তার কারণ হলো আমাদের উদ্দেশ্য এটা লিমিট নাই কারণ যে শুরু থেকে শেষ পর্যন্ত জ্ঞান আলোচনা এবং জ্ঞান বিতরণ করা এবং এটার জন্য এই সেমিনারগুলো আজকে যেটা হলো তার অত্যন্ত খুশি হয়েছে যে এই রকম সেমিনার যেন কামিল যারা সোসাইটি আছে তার এনিসিয়েশন নিয়ে বিভিন্ন জায়গায় প্রোগ্রাম করে ঢাকা হোক বা ঢাকার বাইরে হোক আর আমি মনে করি আসলে সোসাইটি এখন যারা নতুন সদস্য আছে তারা যদি উদ্যোগ নেয় তাহলে এই যে কথাগুলো আলোচনা হয় প্রত্যেক আমাদের সকালের ভিতরে সকালে আলোচনা করলো এক্সপার্ট অফ ক্যানেল ডক্টর যারা আছে তারা আমাদের <laughs> 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 তোমার প্রজাপতির পাখা আমার আকাশ চাওয়া মুগ্ধ চোখের রঙিন সমক মাখা নেভার স্টপ লার্নিং অ্যান্ড ড্রিমিং উই হ্যাভ লস্ট সো মেনি লাইফ সো মেনি ইয়াং লাইফ সো মেনি ভ্যালুয়েবল লাইফ উইথ ইন দ্য লাস্ট ইয়ার অ্যান্ড ইট ওয়াজ সাচ আ ডিপ্রেসিং ইয়ার বাট উই মাস্ট নট স্টপ হিয়ার লার্নিং ইজ আ কন্টিনিউস প্রসেস অ্যান্ড উইথ দ্য চেঞ্জিং মেডিক্যাল সায়েন্স উই শুড অলওয়েজ ট্রাই টু ইমপ্রুভ আওয়ার সার্স and help each other to survive in this competitive world. And still, the audience, if you have any question, you can ask freely to our speakers in our tea time. They are available throughout the program. And the last topic would be by Dr. Horimu Malukdar, a novel oral iron filter, taking his topic. Uh, dear respected audience, good morning and it's a privilege and a great honor for me to present in front of our audience. in the inaugural ceremony of the executive committee of the Entrepreneurial Society of Bangladesh and the scientific seminar. Uh, this is Dr. Parimal Tanjar, uh, Vice President of Research and Development in the Pharmacy University Union. I will give you the brief presentation of the deferrals in Nobel or Alaram later. Today, I want to discuss some topics on the deferrals in us. Uh, what is the Alaram Allah, the accumulation, the accumulating agent, quality aspects of our brand deferrals. and some experimental evidences and the conclusion why the deferrals is the novel iron novel one dear audience uh, deferrals is the novel uh, iron or chelator is we uh, mainly used to reduce the chronic iron overload in patients who are receiving long term blood transfusions and uh, here is the you can see the uh, molecular structure of the deferrals and if uh, i come to the in brief the pharma uh, pharmacodynamics is the oral chelator that is selective against the iron especially iron 3 it is a titrated ligand that binds with high affinity in the 2 to 1 ratio and in brief the mechanism of the two molecules of different acid oxides uh, are capable to bind the one molecule of atom i don't know this is free uh, dear audience why uh, now we need to know the why the iron overload is all of low then Uh, blood transfusion is one of the major cause of the iron overload and is overloaded in the endocrine glands liver and heart and causing severe disease so that's why the the chelation therapy is needed and what is the chelation therapy chelation therapy is like, uh, we need to use a chelator that ligand and that bind with the toxic metal and for a, a complex iron metal that is not toxic and it, it is it from the body and if uh, the particular topic of the deferrals in the deferrals in uh, 
Uh, in the left hand side, the bottom left hand side, there are two molecules of different acids, nine, one molecule of iron in the form of iron three plus. And there are some uh, iron chelating agent that has uh, different examine, different acidox, and diphenyl. And diphenyl, uh, diphenyl acidox is a uh, why it's novel because it's a uh, eight to sixteen hours of half life, and it's a oral, uh, it's a very easy to uh, administer, and uh, the dose is day once daily. Moreover, diphenyl acidox itself is sufficient as a monotherapy in the majority of the patients. Uh, uh, now I would like to take you the overview of the our brand diphenyl and the quality aspects of the Diferox. Why Diferox? Diferox is the our, uh, generic brand. We are following the uh, stringent guideline and the, the molecule is developed by the quality by design. And before going for the commercial production, we have uh, performed the stability study as per ICS guideline. And this is one of the examples of the data of the one plus representative batch, but we have uh, the data for the three development batches. And these are the summary of the uh, uh, three uh, stability batches. Uh, you, you can see that as per ICS guideline, we need to pursue the stability study, the stress condition, as well as the, as per zone four condition, and all the uh, parameters in the well within the limit, and also the distribution is one of the most critical parameters that is also well within the limit. And we are abide by the WHO guideline. And for the WHO guideline, we need to perform uh, several activities to give, a, give an efficient uh, drug product to the patient. And the, uh, the first thing the premise is that uh, manufacturing processes should be uh, designed in such a way that it's uh, cross contamination free. And all the ensure the all the active ingredient is appropriate uh, and the physical state of property ensure that the mixing of the excipients in a homogeneity situation, homogeneity. Ensure the tablet poses the mechanical strength. Uh, if we don't have the uh, mechanical strength enough to hold the tablet property, so uh, patient cannot take it. And uh, uh, another two main uh, part is the uh, minimize, minimize the uh, degradation of the active ingredient and the minimize the risk of microbial contamination. And because we are producing uh, high quality product and the quality is ensured by the very sophisticated instrument, not only in the quality control, but also in the production. We are also using the modern high tech technology, modern high technology that ensures that the product is sufficiently good enough uh, to be consumed by the patient. And uh, uh, also the process to be robust. Here I have seen the experimental evidences that during the manufacturing process, we have to take a lot of samples to ensure the homogeneity. So in, in all the cases, we have found that the results are oil well within the limit. And uh, finally, the assay, that means the active content, it is the, you, you can see uh, the three part initial, middle, and end, all the, in, all, in all the cases, is around is 100 percent. Uh, and one of the major aspects of the dispersable tablet that it should be dispersed within three minutes. But in our cases, it's less than 30 seconds. Within 30 seconds, our tablet is dispersed so that a patient can easily take the uh, medicine. Also, why uh, why different is the choice? You can see uh, I have already discussed that we need to check on the some critical parameter along with other parameters such as MPVD and uh, particle size. It's an API. Each and every lot of API has been tested with that equipment and also the uh, the finished product that we are producing uh, in the form of tablet. Uh, the tablet doses form to the patient. It is also each and every lot has been tested. And the critical uh, parameter hardness, the disintegration time, and the microbial limit and other impurities are oil control and oil within the limit. So uh, if we compare, uh, if we uh, check back with the WHO guidance for the tablet, all the active ingredients, the appropriate particle size and shape, we are maintaining less than 10 micron particle size for the better viability than absorption uh, for the tablet. Uh, mixing with the excipient, the process, the robust process it is also impure. And also the tablet process mechanical strength. This is the hardness is around 80 to 20, 80 to 20 kb. And also minimize the degradation of active ingredient. It is also almost 0%. In a week, it is oil control and uh, in the, also the minimization of the microbial contamination and the cross contamination. All are ensured uh, during the manufacturing process. So whenever you are getting a product referral, you can be ensured that it is the quality is 100%. And so we are 
guarantee that it, uh, whenever you get a deferral, it is 100% quality ensured. And if this is the high standard quality of deferral syrups in the generic version in the form of deferral we are producing, giving you for the patient. And uh, I want to conclude that whenever you, uh, you prescribe a patient for the different strokes, a safety, quality, and efficacy, it is ensured from our end, and it is your part that uh, the patient will get the maximum benefit for the, from the drug.